So welcome Jason Pitson, the VP of sales and customer success at Rad Security. Thank you. Yeah. Happy to be here. Now you guys were on stage yesterday at the Innovation Sandbox final. Yes. Yeah, we were. How, how was the whole experience for you guys? <laughs> uh, it was great. Um, the prep was hard for sure. I know Brooke, uh, practice all weekend and, and just killed it up there. So that was fun. Um, getting that level ex of exposure is always, always huge. And how big was the crowd? It was a full room. And then they had a, which uh, we were guessing is maybe like a thousand people. Um, and then they had a spillover room that was pretty full as well. Uh, we, we snuck out after Brooks talk and grabbed some food <laughs> and then had to go sit in the f spillover room. Decompress a little bit afterwards. Yeah. Right? Yeah, Pretty definitely. stressful all around or just uh, a whole lot of fun? We were definitely nervous for Brooke just because like that's a that's a big stage. But right. um, yeah, it was fun overall. Yeah. Um, yeah. So heck of experience. Getting to the top 10 is is nuts, right? I mean, yeah, uh, I know there's certainly hundreds, if not over a thousand companies usually apply. Yeah, there's got to be at least a thousand people that apply. It's crazy. There's so many startups now. And to get down to top 10 is just uh, it's congratulations yeah. to everyone, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of hard work went into it. Yeah. Now, if I was a CISO and I came up to you guys at RSA and said, oh, I saw you on the stage, but I don't, I don't pay attention. Uh, <laughs> tell me what you guys do. Yeah. How would you answer that question? I would say we, uh, we cover a lot of ground. We have kind of three main use cases. We give um, CISOs and security teams uh, instant visibility into your uh, cloud native workloads. Kubernetes containers, everything that's going on, configurations, all of that stuff. Um, cloud native threat detection and response. That's the big thing that we were pitching yesterday in the sandbox. That's really taking uh, a, a wholly new behavioral based approach to the problem and, and helping speed up SOC analysts efforts in detecting and responding to attacks. Um, and then we cover identity in a really novel way to help with right sizing and access audits. That's really challenging in a cloud native environment. And if you were to describe the problem, like here's the actual thing that security teams are completely, you know, screwed by right now, what yeah. would that be? The biggest thing that our customers come and help, uh, ask for help with is just visibility and awareness of what's actually happening inside their containerized Kubernetes env environments. It's, uh, it, they can't keep up with development. They don't know what's going on. They don't know where packages are being deployed, which ones are actually being used, any of that sort of stuff. So it's that, that kind of raw visibility. That's, that's just huge for them. And the impact for them is what they're, they're, they're just feeling very uncertain or yeah. Yeah, they just, they're getting breached or, or what? Uh, probably breached. They might not even know it. Um, you know, we hear about like crypto miners and, uh, all sorts of stuff like that just popping up and, and people have no idea that it's even in their environment. And so it's that solving that, uh, unawareness, that blind spot for them. Got it. Got it. Well, let's talk about the go to market side. Yeah. Um, now you're early stage, you're, you're getting going. So you're in the mode of let's go find some opportunities. Mm hmm. Interesting environment right now. If you were to look out two years, though, what do you think the state of lead gen, pipe gen is going to be in a couple of years' time? That's, uh, that's a tough one. I feel like in, in our industry in particular, work from home is becoming even more prevalent. I think um, a lot of folks are, even though you, know, hear, you hear all these like horror stories of corporations trying to force employees back and stuff like that, um, I think security's bucking that trend so it's going to be even harder to just do the the raw cold calling and that sort of stuff so i think it's going to be a lot of events in-person meetups um partnerships are really big for us now um technology alliances and resellers and so i think a combo of setting up panels being thought leaders in in events and uh and that sort of stuff is going to be the way to get like quality connections and leads going so at the start, not so much one-to-one -one rep or SDR calling in or whatever. It's going to be, how do we get in front of or in the ecosystem of where people like to hang out already? So yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. I think, I think the cold call is certainly not dead. Um, a lot of the other sales leaders I talked to, we all agree that like getting somebody on a phone is, is still powerful and it still works to some degree, but it's just, it's infinitely more challenging um email and linkedin messaging is 
hard, uh, pretty ineffective, but the, the events getting, getting people connected, um, giving them a place to network and just hang out with their friends. I think that's, that's a big boon for us. Are you investing in SDR this year or next year? We probably will. Um, I'm, I'm still torn, uh, between an SDR team or enterprise reps that have, you know, a Rolodex and experience in what they're doing. Um, time is limited, bandwidth's limited, right? So it's, uh, which one's going to pay off and still, still up in the air on that one. Okay. You know, I think about what's happening right now in sales in general, which is this role of AI and what it's going to replace or not replace when it comes to selling. I think the SDR function is one of, if the SDRs are primarily just doing messaging as opposed to calling, then they're, they're ripe for some sort of replacement. Yeah, for um, sure. What do you think the over under of that is? I, I, you know, five years, would you take the, the over and the under on when an SD, when SDR truly is going to get replaced by S A, uh, AI because it's going to get that good at that time? Mm -hmm. I, um, I was thinking about that and I, I think there's also a component of our customers, right? Do they, do they want to be engaged with by an AI bot yeah. in like a cold call fashion? Right. And I don't think so, but, um, maybe they, maybe they won't know it. I think too, if you have a really good PLG motion, AI instead of SDR all day long, right? Like, Hey, check out this thing. You can try it out for free. It's super easy for a really complex enterprise product, especially that's not an established product. I think that's going to be a lot harder for AI to displace. I think, um, you're going to need the, the nimbleness of, of humans. And I don't know that AI will get there in five years. I think it's still going to be a lot of good sentence guessing the next word type of stuff that we have right now. Right. Yeah. I think if, if, uh, if we're engaging live in a, you know, conversation where people are speaking, I think just a human being is going to be someone who likes to deal with another human being. Mm -hmm. Um, but if, you know, what I hear is a lot of SDR teams are basically doing messaging as opposed to yeah. calling and therefore, I don't know, right? You don't, you, yeah, you I think need the AI bots can blast out messaging all day long. Right. So yeah, I'm with you on that one for sure. Okay. You know, when you think about, uh, the planning for this year and, you know, what you're trying to achieve, would you rather get, um, uh, more leads at lower deal sizes or less leads at bigger deal sizes? For us, I would rather get more leads at smaller deal sizes. Um, we are very much in a growth phase. We need we need more customers using the platform, giving us feedback, that sort of stuff. I think, uh, and we also do a pretty good land and expand motion. Um, we, most of our customers have expanded their footprint within the first year with us. So that's, that's great. So, you know, fast nickels over slow quarters. I think organizations that don't have a land and expand motion that don't like make sense to do it that way. Like, yeah, definitely take the larger deal sizes, fewer leads type of thing. Feels like, uh, you know, logos is, is a focus for most people. Like I'd rather have more customers than, than fewer customers. And there's something you can do with a customer. You can't do with a non-customer, which is to expand and get them happy and get yep. them evangelizing. Yeah. Like that. So yeah, I, I kind of like the way you're thinking about that as an earlier stage company, you're, as you're trying to get going, mm -hmm. um, you know, the right focus area right there. Yeah. My time, um, at bug crowd, when I got into CS and took over CS and kind of changed the way we were doing it. Um, it was really because we weren't upselling and expanding our customers. We, we were just renewing them and at best maybe selling them like a pen test afterwards type of thing. And, um, I read, I read the, the, the Bible of, uh, customer success by, um, Gainsight CEO. And it just like detailed out how to, operationalize everything. Um, but my sales hat was always just like, but we can, you know, we can talk about new use cases, new teams that need this, blah, blah, blah. And so I've, I've always had this CS customer base should be a point of revenue for sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I talked to Tim Eads, who's, um, uh, I guess general partner at cyber mentor fund. And he was saying, you know, he encourages his companies, you know, almost hire CS 
uh, before sales because you yeah. you want to get the 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 value that they're seeing the value feeling the value getting the success coming through because that's a very powerful thing as opposed to just throwing salespeople at the problem. Yeah, and I thought that was an interesting perspective. Yeah, we we will probably hire a CS person um, pretty quickly uh, because we want to. We want to make sure our customers are adopted. Like I said earlier, there's, we cover a lot of ground. There's a lot of use cases. We need to have a really good focus on getting that widespread adoption. Yeah. Yeah. What's something that's just generally held to be true in sales and marketing right now that you think is complete bullshit? <laughs> um, I think sales doesn't need to be as complex as a lot of people try and make it out to be. I think, uh, more. I, I hear, and maybe it's cause I, um, I get chatted up by junior salespeople trying to figure out how to, how to progress their career and stuff. And it feels like there's this, um, sense that you've got to really overcomplicate things, really like build this, this science machine around engaging with people, understanding their problem and presenting a solution that hopefully is real in your portfolio. And I think if you just break it down to that, that basis, it doesn't need to be that complex. Sure. Like pricing and packaging and negotiations can be complex, but the whole, just engaging with folks, getting them through a sales process should be as, as simple and as easy for the customer to engage with as possible. What's an example where we do in this one area, we just overcomplicate things way too much. I hear horror stories of people, um, requesting demos and taking taking weeks to get set up like getting getting a trial set up is complex and hard and uh that's just bonkers to me why would you make it hard to have people test your software yeah i feel like it was the fastest way we could possibly get uh them to touch it feel it experience yeah. it things like that yeah uh, as opposed to put the barriers in the way say well we're going to qualify you three times before yeah. <laughs> you know you get to speak to someone who may or may not even be any good <laughs> yeah and i get it, like you know of course there's there's tire kickers out there that just want to test software and i i think it's maybe with my experience i think it's easy to suss those people out but i think if there's a legit organization and a legit titled person who carries the initial conversation appropriately you know like there's good sales conversations and then there's tire kicker conversations and i think once you can get a gut for that, you can, you can then remove all of those barriers and just say, all right, cool. Like we're going to do it, but you, you know, we need the intent to buy, of course, but we're happy to do it. We're happy to do it quickly and, and in a way that benefits you. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, well, kind of along the same lines, uh, with your, your approach to selling, would you rather your team really focus on the here and now pain features benefits of, of what you do, or would you rather they work with their prospects on much bigger business value, uh, projects? Yeah. I really like this question because I think, um, I get to wax politically. Um, uh, it depends on who they're talking to, right? I think engineer level folks don't really connect with business value conversations. I think like some of the more mature ones who are clearly going to progress quickly in their career care about business value, but a lot of them really care about how does this make my job easier, better, faster. And that's a feature benefit combo executives, management, decision makers. They obviously care about business value. So I want my reps understanding who they're talking to and having the appropriate conversation. Yeah. And it's tough to do because you can be very aware of who you're working with. Yes. You know, we, you say that and it sounds all sensible, sensible, yeah, sensible totally. and logical, right? <laughs> yeah. But when you're in a meeting and you got four or five people and you're trying to understand who does what and how it all hangs together, it can be difficult for the reps to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think that goes to, uh, actually back to like, what can AI help us with? I think meeting summaries, meeting prep AI bots are going to be really valuable. So I'm all for that for sure. And so I think, you know, the reps doing an appropriate amount of meeting prep should hopefully make that easier, but yeah, for sure. It can still get complex, but, um, you know, reading the room, having, having a deal gut, uh, I think is 
important for anybody that's going to be successful and they should be able to have audience appropriate conversations. Yeah. One thing in your favor now is you don't need to be sitting there taking a bunch of notes all the time. Right? Yeah. So you've got your, your, um, your gongs or choruses, whatever you have, just going to, you'll be able to go back and figure out the, the details. So you can just kind of let it go a little bit and just, I guess, be more aware of, of who you have in the room and what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to choruses call review too. That's fantastic. Is it? Yeah. Like the top 10, here's what you guys talked about. Here's the action steps. Super helpful. It's remarkable just in two years how good these tools have got at that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I use something called Fathom, and I'm always amazed that it just perfectly nails all these things. <laughs> main points, the action items, the whole thing. It's, it's actually pretty impressive. Nice. Um, so what's, if, if you're a rep right now and they're looking to get better at, at or more successful, let's say, selling what they have at their company, do you think they should, and they've got, you know, I don't know what, a day a week, let's say. Should they spend that time understanding more about how their product solves problems and things like that? Or should they spend that time um, understanding their prospects and the lives of their prospects better? It can be both. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I got into sales uh, way back in the day after being like a pretty nerdy kid, like building computers and designing websites and stuff. And so getting it to Rapid7 where I first started, computer security was super interesting to me. Um, so I spent a lot of time understanding the product and how we solved problems. And I think that accelerated me really quickly in the process. Um, but we were, we were able to sell to kind of like the manager or director level and get things done without having to talk to execs by and large. Um, so I think I got may be lucky, but I think that was really valuable for me. And, and anybody who even remotely thinks of themselves as technical, I would say, do that, like focus on your strengths. Right. Um, but I think there's a lot of salespeople who get into cybersecurity, which is a complex industry that are not technical by any means, but they just, you know, can, can sell software well. So I would say for them, focus on your strengths and, and go after, you know, the business value stuff. Let's, uh, let's take a different tack then. Uh, we're going to play a game, fizzle or sizzle. Are these things, things that are going to sizzle, keep being hot and be successful and grow, or are they going to fizzle and just fizzle out and be, be nothing? So first one is fizzle or sizzle, this cyber truck. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say it's going to fizzle. Why is that? There's been so many reports of like the, the exterior getting messed up because it's not properly coded the the construction of all tesla vehicles is always suspect so i don't know it's also just super ugly <laughs> <laughs> and people stop and look that's for sure it's, yeah, it's eye-catching but it's and not not because they go wow that's yeah. beautiful they go oh okay i haven't seen one of those before yeah it's like the opposite of a lamborghini <laughs> that's right <laughs> it's true um okay fizzler or sizzle the Palo Alto play to be the platform company in cybersecurity. I mean, Wiz just took a billion dollars this morning. So did you hear? I that? didn't see that. Oh yeah. Yeah. They, um, Andreessen, uh, and a bunch of other folks put in a billion dollars. They announced this morning. So I think Palo Alto has got their money, uh, got, a, got a good fight ahead of them for sure. Um, I don't think they're going to win. I think they're going to fizzle. I think Wiz is just going to gobble everything up. Well, that was my next question then. Who's going to have the biggest valuation in five years time, Palo Alto or Wiz? What's Palo's market cap right now? I think they got to just about a hundred billion recently. It might have dropped oh, off a yeah. little bit, but it's in the 80 to a hundred billion range. I guess if Wiz can go public soon, maybe, but there, I mean, I think just mathematically, Palo Alto is going to win because five years isn't enough time for Wiz to catch up. Do you know what the valuation of the raise was this morning? Though? 12. 12. Yeah. So they have to 10 X in five years. Yeah. Which I mean, I guess they've done what? 400 million in revenue in four years. So maybe <laughs> who knows, right? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It'd be interesting to see how it plays out. That's for sure. Yeah. So this cyber truck has about 50 miles left on its charge. Is this going to last longer than cold calling right now? <laughs> uh, maybe. <Yeah. laughs> what's, I, what's harder? 
growing the pipeline right now or dealing with your CEO? I, I've worked for Brooke three times now. Um, she was my first boss at Rapid7 like 17 years ago or whatever. So I know her well. I know how she operates. Uh, growing pipeline definitely is harder. So what's a bigger waste of money? This Cybertruck or getting a booth at the uh, Black Hat <laughs> Conference? <laughs> Do I own the Cybertruck or am I just renting it? Oh, you own it. You're going <laughs> to buy the full value. Uh, I mean, I guess you at least can transport stuff in the truck. Um, I don't know. Booths, booths are pretty worthless these days. I think, I think you kind of have to at some point for a few years, like series A to series C, like a well-known series C, I think you can drop out of buying a booth all the time, or at least like start downgrading, but we need the exposure. So we're going to like have to get booths moving forward. Kind of goes with it really, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. That one's a tough one. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, that? like the leads are not great from booths. So that's, that's right. the hard part. What's a bigger waste of time, this cyber truck or traditional sales training? The cyber truck. I think traditional sales training is still super valuable. I think um, we've gone through, or I've done uh, the the force management guys, command of the message, um, a couple of times now, and then um, we did Sandler sales a couple of times at Bug Crowd, and I really liked that. So I think those are super valuable. Even if you've done them several times, I think you're always going to walk away with something interesting and. And like, oh yeah, I, I got to remember to do that. So sales training is super important. Yeah. I feel like, um, no one is in the mode where they can't get better Yeah, and they just have to figure out, well, how am I going to get better? What can I take from this, whatever this is mm -hmm. and, and get a little bit better. Yeah. Um, having said that though, what's a bigger waste of time sitting in San Francisco traffic like we are right now or reading all the sales advice on LinkedIn? Oof. Uh, the sales advice for sure. I think that is like distilled down sales training into like the most obliv obvious, like worthless statements. Uh, there are a few like gold nuggets every few weeks that I'm like, oh yeah, that's a good rem reminder or a good trick to do. Um, but it's, yeah. You know, I post on LinkedIn, right? I don't. <laughs> I, I think, um, there's just so many salespeople who are like, I'm going to start a sales book and sell it for you know $400 or whatever. And I think it's, that's cool that that worked for you, but I think the, the context matters a ton. And I would rather my reps do an actual sales training in person and like have it tailored to them. Like the, the force management guys do. And what's the bigger waste of time sitting in San Francisco traffic or prepping for three days for a board meeting? Traffic. I think board meetings super important to prep for. I think it's uh, it's both important to like instill confidence in them, but I think um, being able to figure out and and anticipate their their tough questions is super important. Okay. Uh, philosophical one for sales: Would you rather hire more people at a lower cost per person to get coverage? Or would you rather hire fewer people at a higher cost per person to get focus quality? Focus quality. Why is that? Um, I think if you have more people purely like for a coverage, assuming not all salespeople are created equal and you might have some mishires, hiring more people, you're going to have more chances of mishires, right? Um, I think it also sets you up for potentially not being ready for that coverage. So if you hire two, like if, if I suddenly went out and hired 10 people, hmm. we're not ready for the volume of customers 10 people might bring on versus the, the two of us that we are now. So I think um, get focused, stay focused, get your right customers, nail your right ICP, and then grow and expand as you build up all the back end infrastructure to support it. So especially at super early stage, you need to have the quality of people to understand and ask the right questions as opposed to someone who just kind of goes through the, the playbook as it were. Yeah. 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 And I think, I think it's like at our stage, right. Um, I think if you hire kind of a, a 
coin operated salesperson who doesn't care about building process and documenting and really sinking their teeth into the the company and the the position you can really frustrate them and give them a bad experience which is going to just have ripple effects across the board okay um probably the most important question of today is do you think taylor swift and travis kelsey will make it through the postseason <laughs> That is such a weird world out there, huh? Um, I I don't think they're gonna make it. No, I think they'll break up. I think. Uh, God, I, don't... I I did read. Um, maybe it wasn't reading. Maybe it was on the radio. But somebody was saying that Travis is the right kind of edgy for Taylor. Like he's just a good old American boy that likes to party and drink beers and stuff. Not like the other kind of edgy she could have ended up with, and so. Maybe their PR teams will keep them together for a while. <laughs> oh, you're a cynic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm a, I mean, I, that comes from uh, being a metalhead at heart. So Taylor is definitely not like my genre to begin with. So right. it's easy for me to pick on her. Well, Jason, I enjoyed having you in the cyber truck today. Yeah. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we're braving the San Francisco traffic, but uh, it's actually probably busier in the expo hall than it is out here, if it's hard to believe. Yeah. It's yeah, the fun. expo hall looked crazy yesterday when I walked through it. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thank you.